And I had this fear of like asking help from my Jewish father, right? So because because he said that it would be it would mean that you failed. But it's so funny. I had the story many years later. Like I asked for help finally, and he was like, "It's about goddamn time you asked for help." <laughs> What's up, everybody? My name is Adam, and I'm the host of the You Know Adam Same podcast, the show that is dedicated on bringing on passionate people, learning about their stories, and delivering value to entrepreneurs. So if that's what you're interested in, go ahead and follow, like, and subscribe. You know what I'm saying? How's it going, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the You Know Adam Sane podcast, where you get to know just a little bit more about people, passions, and all things business. Today, super, super excited to be speaking with Mr. Kai Nguyen. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much, man. It's awesome. Yeah, it's awesome glad. To be here. Yeah, so, you know... Uh, I have to kind of like intro the way that we connected. Uh, you know, there's this great platform out there called AHN. Uh, it stands for Asian Hustle Network. Uh, and, you know, there was, uh, you, you were, you had made a post kind of like, you know, trying to, you know, get onto podcasts and that sort of thing. And, you know, I kind of like reached out and we connected on that, for, that, that format. So uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. No, no. It's amazing to be here. And I'm, I'm glad you reached out because it's like, you never know who, who's uh, going to reach out. Like I get a bunch of spam. I get a bunch of requests, you know, you get, I mean, similar probably to you. Like it's hard to filter that out. And I just was like, who the, who's this guy? You know, <laughs> I don't know. It was just like one of those where, and it's like, I appreciate that you reached out uh, in the way that you did because not many people uh, do it in an authentic way. Like they're either looking for something, you know, they're trying to sell mm. something and it's generally not the right approach. Yeah. So, you know, uh, to filter this, you know, I, I looked you up on LinkedIn and I kind of like started trying to understand like who you were. And I was just very kind of like, um, I was like, dude, this guy shouldn't be like, you know, going on other people's podcasts. He should be doing a podcast himself. You are a investor, uh, operator. There's multiple different features of like the things that you're involved with. Um, but, you know, just to kind of like put into like a nutshell, what is it that you do? I'm, a, I'm essentially, if you had to boil, boil it down, I'm an entrepreneur and operator. So I've been... I mean, I've been operating businesses since I was 16. Um, I was adopted by a Jewish family when I was 16. So that's when my journey started was uh, my Jewish dad was like, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, I want to run a business. And so he actually went out and bought two companies out of bankruptcy and made me run it. Right. But the way he did it is cause my Jewish dad is very unconventional. You know, um, mm. he basically bought two co companies out of bankruptcy. I mean, they were in disarray. I mean, you know, out of bankruptcy, it's generally in, there's a lot of issues with it. So he basically handed it to me and said, you're running these two businesses. This is what you asked for. And if you ask me for help, you failed. So, wow. so it's kind of like, in a way, I, I wouldn't say thrown into the fire, but it's very close to that, right? It's kind of like being like nudged into the fire. That's wild. Um, so I, I'm curious about kind of like, you know, starting. You said age 16 was when uh, you were adopted by the Jewish family. What was life like before that point in time? Uh, I actually had a really good childhood. I mean, I grew up in uh, Bellingham, Washington because we immigrated. Uh, we escaped the Vietnam War um, with wow. my family. Um, it's a cr whole crazy story behind that. But essentially, my, my Vietnamese dad built a boat or several boats and he... He basically escaped uh, the North after they invaded the South um, with his life and some family members and friends. And he got off the coast in the boats. I think it was six boats with about 40, 50 people. And we went, I believe, six days, six nights without food. Um, and we, we, I mean, think of the probability of living on that. That's like it's very low probability, Crazy. right? And at the time, uh, there was a, a mandate for the U.S. not to pick up refugees anymore. Because you think about it, this is call it 1983. I mean, the Vietnam War ended in in the, in the 70s, right? So um, this was already the North already took over the South and was like you know like persecuting uh, the you know Southern people that weren't converting to communism, etc. So. Um, 
you know, skipping all that history, let's just say it was very dangerous, obviously, in the, the whole ocean in these tiny boats. So it was like six days, six, six nights. We ran into an aircraft carrier. The, the, I think it's the ESS Enterprise. Um, and there's actually, we have photos of it, which, which blows my mind. Like there's actually photos of it. And they broke protocol and picked us up, right? Because I mean, just humanitarian, like, you know, of ethic, course. Like, whatever it is. They picked us up, uh, brought us to the Philippines, which was a neutral country. And then from the Philippines, we got shipped to uh, and sponsored by a, 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 an American family, a military family in, in Bellingham, Washington. Wow. And, and so like this uh, experience, do you have any memories of this uh, happening and in, in any like, you know, impact on kind of like your life in this day and age? I'm 100 percent positive it has had a mental and personal impact. Uh, memories, not so much on the aircraft carrier or before that. I have photos that my parents have shown me. Um, but my first memory is probably, it's not Bellingham, actually. We were in Everett, Washington first, and then we moved to Bellingham. But yeah, my first memory is in Everett, Washington. I, I, it's funny because I, I talked to my Vietnamese parents pretty often. I brought this up and they were really surprised the, 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 how vivid my recollection of that my childhood was. Like I can uh -huh. literally remember what I was wearing, certain like events that happened. Uh, first job ever we had as a family was picking strawberries, and I can tell I, I told them exactly what we were doing. Like we would pick strawberries uh, and um, blue. Uh, what is it? Blackberries, blueberries, and then we put in buckets, and then you exchange the buckets for these coins, and then you take the coins, and then they give you cash on the coins. And mm -hmm. what I had to be like four or five. And my parents uh -huh. were like, wow, you know, your, the detail of your descriptions are very, very vivid. Right? Like, like, you know, we didn't expect that. So I, those are my earliest memories. And they were very, you know, I'm very fond of those memories. Um, it was a very happy time, right? If you're escaping mm -hmm. prosecution. Uh, I don't know if that, that, that's the way we explain it. Prosecution in, in, in Vietnam uh, or oppression, whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, per Probably, probably, probably like persecution is the of, word. Uh, death, right? You're escaping death um, after the North, you know, took over the South. So going from that to, you know, being with your family in a new country, in a democratic country, uh, sponsored by a military American family is like, that's already a win, right? So growing up, yeah, to answer your question, growing up was a, in, in, in Washington was a, was quite a pleasure. I think, you know, what's interesting here is that, you know, I think a lot of people like that are living in the States don't realize what this country is. Right. Like, I think that they don't realize what the how nice it is here, how how good it is where like this is the land of opportunity. And what I've seen time and time again, uh, even from my family uh, that immigrated to the U.S. is like, you know, you work hard, you kind of like, you know, do the things that you you need to do and there's a possibility to achieve that american dream um and so that that that's one of the things that really stands out about you know the the uh being in the boat uh being in coming to the u.s um i wanted to kind of like ask you a specific question here is like you mentioned at age 16 you were adopted how did that adoption actually occur that's a really good question um because i get asked that a lot especially w when this comes up I was at 14, I was already working full time. Um, at 13, I was running my parents' um, gas station, the night shift, which was because we were open 24 7 um, mm -hmm. in a very bad neighborhood. And um, think about it 13, I'm starting probably at like 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., that's my shift. And I'm selling cigarettes and alcohol and, you know, <laughs> looking back is like, it's like, that's how we do it in back in the day. Right. But now it's like, yeah. oh man, that'd be like child abuse and all this stuff. And it's like, no, that to us was normal. You know, you, you, yeah. Yeah. like, like the, this concept of like, especially for immigrants of working at a very young age is, is kind of ingrained in you as part of the tradition and the culture. Right. So there's no child abu abuse in that. And I really don't believe that in the, in the U.S. too, right? I mean, yeah, you can take advantage of it, but like 
believe me, I know some 13 year old kids that are very, very capable of running businesses and thinking for themselves. You know what I mean? Did you have, but, do you have any stories of kind of like that period of time? Like, were you, were you <laughs> like, do I? Did people yeah, come yeah. and like bully you? Um, well, I got bullied quite a bit growing up in general. Um, that, that, I think that affected me quite a bit. Um, because I was a big introvert and, you know, as a, in, you know, growing up in a traditional Asian family, it's kind of like, Hey, let it go, you know, type thing. Yeah. Um, instead of like, you know, I, I feel like if I was a dad now, I'd be like, nah, you gotta fight back. You know what I mean? Like you can't let someone walk all over you. That's not cool. You know? Um, yeah. but it's like, keep your head low, stay out of trouble. And if someone gets in a fight with you, it's, it's your fault type thing. Right. Um, and I have st- plenty of stories. Um, one story that um, is very personal is uh, probably when I was around 12, 13, no, no, even younger than that, um, I was bullied by a kid twice my size. And I remember he took like some wristband that I had and he wouldn't give it back. And so we kind of got in this little shuffle and then he started beating me up, right? So, mm. I mean... I protected myself. I swung back and I think he ended up basically like my face was like busted up. Right. My, okay. I was bleeding. I was bleeding on, uh, in my, my eye was purple. <laughs> I was bleeding all this stuff. And I think I got a couple shots in and his ears were bleeding. So he had like some cuts on his ear. I, I just, that's all I remember. Um, twice size, some black kid, you know? Yeah. And then I went to the, to the principal to report it like, Hey, you know, and they suspended both of us wow. for fighting. Wow. Yeah, and so me being me, like I was like, okay. And he even begged me not to. Like, yeah, I remember he was like, don't go because they're going to suspend us both. And I was like, no, they're not. Like, they're going to suspend you, bro. You know, like, <laughs> but nope, nope. Both of us got suspended. Um, I got a pink slip. I was suspended, I think, for two days. I went home, walked home. And I remember walking home thinking like, you know, my dad's going to sort this all out. Like, you know, he's gonna, got my back. He's got my back. And then I come home and then he finds out I got suspended and then he beats me up, you know? So <laughs> I'm, double, like, du- I'm like, Yo, double whammy. I got beat up twice in one day, you know, like that was like the environment I grew up in. And I mean, the extent of what trauma did to me or whatever, I probably would never know, but I'm sure it has some effect, you know, to this day. But I mean, I've spent a lot of time working on myself, so I'm very confident and self-aware in those sort of things. Did he give you a reason as to why? Uh, yeah. I mean, you're 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 suspended, right? Mm. First of all, and you should be staying out of trouble. Mm. So, doesn't matter what the what the explanation is. You know, I think the way he looked at it was, you know, you're still getting suspended from school, so. That's yeah. A, yeah. That's a no no. Yeah, I think I think you know our, our especially my parents uh, always taught a lot of like, and, and it's the Asian way, right? Like, hey, remain like under the radar, like don't kind of like you know cause trouble and that sort of thing. But you know, it, it's a shame that I, I think even regardless of the reason why the event actually took place, they still it's still like you know we're being still reprimanded for that. Um, but how do we get to kind of like age 16 and, you know, making that turn and being adopted by, you know, the Jewish family? From a young age up until probably 14, I was a straight A student. Like my family was hardcore into like, you've got to get straight A's, right? Just like, you know, it's not very, you know, it's not very uncommon of Asian families to require that from their kids. Um, it was when I turned... 13, 14, 15, um, and I was working, you know, I was probably working a lot at my parents' um, businesses that I kind of started getting my own independence and kind of thinking on my own, right? Doing extracurricular activities after school, being in the tennis program, that sort of stuff. So um, I got uh, I got kicked out of the house because of over an argument. Um, my parents were very hardcore religious i mean i would i would i would say borderline catholic zealot like i mean they were going to church twice a day you know mm. after school i was required to come home immediately 
and go to church and then do the prayers after church, uh, which was, you know, good three hours, you know. And, and at that age, you're like, you don't understand why, but what you do understand, what I did understand was I didn't like it, right? <laughs> I yeah. can't, I mean, I have ADD or whatever. I can't sit down, you know, in a spot for more than 30 minutes and concentrate, let alone pray, you know. So um, I kind of had enough of it and started by doing doing my own thing you know playing tennis going on the tennis team and then you know we got in a heated debate once a fight with my father and he was like you know if you're if you're uh living under my roof you're li- living under my terms right and i go okay then i guess uh that won't be happening then so mm. in a way it was like a kind of like in the moment heated debate and so i left um and so i started living out of my truck at the time I was 15, um, living out of my truck. You know, my dad had given me this truck. It was a beat up like like 2001 Nissan pickup truck. Love that truck. Um, and I would live, you know, I'd sleep out of the truck in the parks and, you know, sleep over it. I had friends that, you know, that um, had like, what do you call it? Like um, halfway homes, right? They would like take mm-hmm. in runaways and stuff like that. So... Uh, really appreciative of that, but it's a very dangerous environment for someone, you know, like a kid to be in because I just remember being in those sort of homes and, you know, parties all the time and gang members growing through and things like that. So um, I have a bunch of stories on that, but, um, but yeah, we skipped to 16. I was in high school and my my grades start tanking because I was working full time. I was I was already doing like grown man work, you know, at sixteen. I was doing uh, bookkeeping. what were you doing? Mm-hmm. I was book, doing bookkeeping for small businesses. Then I started doing operations, HR, and then essentially like running all of operations for these small businesses. First was a sign company, company that sold signs to like businesses, right? Hospitals and you know car dealerships and stuff like that. And um, I was doing door-to-door sales. I remember I was doing sales at the Grand Prix for the um, for the programs, like programs, get your programs, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so that forced me out of my comfort zone, obviously. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was a hustler. I started being a hustler at that age. Um, my one of my first jobs actually was doing IT work, and one of my childhood friends, Hugo, got me that job. And yeah, we, there were some good times there you know not some not so good times but i've never had a minimum wage job other than when i was a kid you know picking strawberries like these were like a grown man job right doing bookkeeping and all this stuff i commanded a higher wage um although not much higher but i never i never never really settled for um minimum wage because of the skill sets i knew i had but i was you know at that age it's like you do get take advantage of by adults right in the sense that they go like, oh, you're only worth this much. I think uh, minimum yeah. wage at the time was seven dollars. Um, I was doing operations at the sign company, and I was getting paid, I believe, ten dollars an hour. So that's like a thirty percent, you know, uh, rate that's higher than the minimum wage. So why do you think people were willing to give you the chance? Like, what was it about you that you know? that people were like okay well let's kind of like go with this guy you know because you're like what 15 16 at this point right like what mm-hmm. what, what was the, I think what was the differentiating what, what, factor <laughs> very easy uh skill set was there and cheap labor like if you mm-hmm. wanted to hire you look, think about it right if you're i mean they were hustlers too right these small businesses um they were indian owned you know hispanic owned etc um and they were all small businesses so I would come in and I would show them that I can do the job and they would probably pay me half of what they would have to pay, you know, like a grown adult. During this period of time, I bet there was so much that you learned. Like, you know, even even though you weren't getting paid a ton, like you were kind of like being able to basically understand. You you mentioned bookkeeping, which like for uh, normally for like a 14 year old, 15 year old, that's out outside of the realm that they would even be capable of, <laughs> yeah. right? Yep. And and this is yep. this is pre this is probably pre was this pre internet like how did how were you able yeah. to kind of like do all these things? Uh, honestly, it was it was because of um, running the two businesses that my Jewish dad, you know, kind of pushed me to run. 
I mean, I, I had to learn everything from scratch. Like I had to do inventory, I had to do sales, I had to do AR, accounts receivables, accounts payable, um, everything. I ran the business top, you know, from from bottom up. So if you become, if you do, if anyone goes to that type of training, I mean, you become an operator, mm-hmm. right? You become an operator and you do it enough, you become an expert operator and it doesn't really matter what industry you're in. I mean, it's process is very similar. So probably by like 17, 18, I was a pretty, pretty capable operator. So it, people kind of knew that. Right. And, and the stuff that I learned, we just kept adding on, like, you know, doing door to door sales. I did that for, 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 for a couple months. Um, I remember I was getting hit up by MLMs quite a bit, right? And I was just like, ah, this don't feel right, right? So I've, I've gone through that entire process. Um, and to be honest, a lot of it is just trial and error. You know what I mean? But, mm-hmm. but, I, but at the time, I did know that I can operate stuff, right? So, and I knew that I was like, you know, my skill set is probably not flipping burgers. Not that I was yeah. like beneath it. It was just like, I can do this other stuff. Well, you know, why don't I do that instead? You know? Mm-hmm. Uh, at what point did you realize that the entrepreneurship was the route? Like, was this kind of like from this onset of the two businesses? Or at what point did you feel like, hey, man, this is this is what I want to do with my life? It wasn't until later. Um, my dream was actually to go work on Wall Street. Which you did. Which I did. Which I did. And But, but think about it, though. I grew up around entrepreneurs, right? My dad, as an immigrant, is a natural-born entrepreneur, you know, mm-hmm. starting from scratch. Um, with nothing, you know, no no money or nothing to to his name. Uh, my my older brother was an entrepreneur, um, but you know it wasn't encouraged. Like entrepreneurship wasn't encouraged, right? So you know we didn't have any chats about, you know, hey, you should think about like starting your own business. I mean, this is this is the period where I was already kicked out of the house and doing my own thing, right? So I kind of had to navigate that light that life aspect by myself um, and through my friend Hugo, you know, got me the IT job. Um, I mean, if you think about it, I was, this is, this is the sort of stuff that people should go through is you got to try every single thing out there, right? You got to try sales, you got to try operations, you got to try, you know, whatever. And what it teaches you is not what you want to do. It teaches you what you don't want to do. And mm. I really believe in that. So. I was forced into that at a very young age. So at a very young age, I was already crossing stuff off, off my list that, that I didn't want to do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So um, it's almost like a trial period. So um, I'd say, you know, by 17, 18, when I was in, you know, starting to go to college, I kind of had a pretty good understanding of what I didn't want to do. But I was still doing trial and error even through, through you know, college. So, but... Um, uh, where we're at. Um, talk, talk, talk to me about how you like, so, you know, you've, you kind of like have been running these two businesses. You're kind of like crushing it. Um, and then at what point, like, do you identify like wall street and start moving towards that direction? Okay. Um, I mean, honestly, when I was running the business at 16, I never felt that I was crushing it. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> like in, like in hindsight, you could say that, but, um, no, I was struggling. I mean, you think about it, like, you, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Right, uh-huh. and I had this fear of like asking help from my Jewish father. Right, so because because he said that it would be it would mean that you failed. Yeah, but he's in. It's so funny because we talk years later, and like you know, those are just things he get he got uh, he would say to me to kind of make me think for my own on my own. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Um, but it's so funny. I have the story many years later. Like I asked for help finally, and he was like, "It's about goddamn time you asked for help." <laughs> You know, so like how, I said, how many years after? How oh many years God, after? I probably didn't ask for help from my Jewish father until I was like 26. Wow. Yeah, I was like, I got to do everything on my own, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. So, and he allowed that. He, he was like, you've got to think for yourself type thing, right? Um, and he showed me by action rather than by telling me what to do. So, um, so yeah, I, I would consider I was crushing it. I was definitely learning a lot. At the time, I was very overwhelmed. You know, I got these two struggling businesses. I did my best. Um, I was working a lot. Um, I'm sure I was learning a lot, but when you're kind of in that moment and you're that young, you're just absorbing so much stuff. 
you don't really know how much it you're retaining. You don't know how, how much it applies to some stuff you're doing in the future, right? You're just like in the moment. I was just in the moment, right? I got to turn these two businesses around. So um, one was, was a cosmetic company and the other was a, a vitamin supplement company. Um, the vitamin supplement company, I turned around successfully and then my dad sold it. And then um, the cosmetic company, I believe, failed. But my Jewish dad is so smart because he ran... Um, one of the largest packaging company on the West Coast, um, at, at you know now um, well, he's retired, but he he had a packaging company, and the way he structured it was he he bought these companies out of bankruptcy, and the requirement was that he was the sole supplier for the manufacturing and the packaging, oh. right? So he got paid first. You know what I'm saying? So he was smart in that sense because he hedged his bets, right? So he yeah. he made money no matter what. So whether the, I failed on the business or not, he made money on it because I would have to pay him first to, to package it, you know? Yeah. So a uh, question here. Why did he buy two companies instead of just like, hey, like, let's get you one? Was it just like, hey, <laughs> he, this is the guy? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> this is the prophecy. <laughs> this, I, I, I dreamed about it once. Um, <laughs> I honestly believe, and this might be a surprise to them and they may disagree or, or, or agree, um, you know, he, I have a Jewish brother and he never wanted to be in business, you know, um, so I was kind of like the son that he kind of wanted, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, because we, there's a lot of stuff that we related about, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we related about. So, uh, even at my young age, um, I, th I don't know why he gave me two businesses. <laughs> I think he just found two opportunities. Right. And he was just like, okay, run them both. You know, yeah. I don't. I, I I actually have to ask him. I don't know if there's actual a logical reason why there was two instead of one. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, so you know, uh, let's get get caught up. So um, you have this dream of working on Wall Street, and that dream came to you like at what period of time? When was that like introduced into your kind of like ecosystem? I was going to Cal State Long Beach at the time. Uh, so this is college. Um, I barely made it into school. <laughs> like I barely made it. Um, freshman, sophomore year, I really struggled. Um, I, I, remember, I, I think my, uh, I believe my, I, I was studying engineering at the time. I think it's computer engineering. Yeah. I was following my cousin in computer engineering. And then when I hit the math portion, I was like, yeah, I can't be a, a computer engineer. <laughs> mm. I so so w at that point I was like, what can I switch to that's a little bit easier on the math? And I chose business. Um, and then I eventually just happenstance, which just chose uh, business administration, which included a track in real estate, finance, uh, and economics. Um, and I just remember. I'm not going to make it in engineering. There's just no way, right? Uh, I knew my limitations and I knew my, like, you know, my, my focus. With my focus, I, I wouldn't be able to make it. So I switched, I switched um, uh, paths and then I started taking these business courses. And I remember taking the first finance course and they were like, you know, um, when you buy and sell securities, and I remember this moment where I was like, you can buy security, like security guards? You know what I mean? <laughs> I remember that. And, there, and it was like, they're talking about stocks. And that was my knowledge at the time of the markets, right? The, the mm. financial markets. Like it was so, it was like literally z zero or negative. So, but it really intrigued me. Um, and I, I started, that's when I kind of knew I want to be on Wall Street. I was like, this is fascinating stuff. And I luckily had really good teachers and mentors at the time. And Cal State Long Beach had these hidden programs that were amazing. We had a student management invest student managed investment fund, where you manage the school's fund, right? Um, I joined. I, I dude, I did everything to join that program, and you know me, man. I ain't stopping until I get in, right? Mm -hmm. So I get into that program. Um, that's where I met my best friend um, Jonas Neubauer, and we became uh, really good friends. In I think believe junior year or sophomore year and we spent all our time 
doing all the finance courses and stuff like that uh, together. And we did a, a, these special projects that weren't really advertised to students. So one was we worked with uh, one of my professors. Her name is Jasmine. Um, she had a project in, 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 in the class where you would do a white paper on whatever study you want. And it's on, you know, economic studies or stock market studies. And we did a white paper on, I think, the re returns of S&P over different market periods and, you know, um, how, 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 I mean, I don't even know. I remember we got published though, right? Yeah. We got, I mean, this was, I was at what, like maybe 19? Okay. 19 at the time. And we were already published in the Journal of Business and Economics. Um, and so the, I remember me and Jonas, we looked at each other and we were like, um, no, no, we, we, we talked about it because she had a program where she would teach a class, you'd write this white paper and the top group, which was, you know, two people would go around the country, get published and speak at these conferences. That was wow. like, that was like the prize. Right. I mean, and so I remember me. So you, get, so you got to speak around the country. Well, it's a funny story because me and Jonas at first were like, let's just like crush it, get it, and just turn her down in front of the class. <laughs> like that was, I don't know why, we just decided on that, right? Um, and I remember we did the presentation and we crushed it. And she was like, you guys are the, the number one group in the class. So, you know, would you like to go travel around the country and present this? And mind you, we had decided not to say no right in front of her, in front of class, right? And we looked at each other and then Jonas was like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh shit, okay, okay, I guess we're doing this. And so, dude, I swear to God, we spent the next six months flying to New Orleans, uh, New Orleans, Vegas. I mean, we were presenting in front of economists, you know, hundreds of people, um, economists and grown adults. We were the only kids there. Yeah. Yeah. What a, what an amazing like experience for you. Yeah. I made right? the, like, I definitely the, made, it took the most advantage out of my college. Like we would find these programs and then the, um, student, uh, managed investment fund was interesting. They only chose like 12 students out of the business program and you had to be vetted and all this stuff. And I just found out about it. And I, I found previous students. I befriended previous students that had been in the program. My friend, yeah. my friend, Mike and, Sam and I was like, "Hey, I want to get in this program. Like, I, w I want you to help me." So they would put in good words for me th to the professor, and I would go to the prof professor's office every single day. Mm. And I go, "Here's my application, but I, I, I'm, I'm getting into this program. Like, you, you want me in this program? Trust me, you know." What, you know, there's so many students out there, right? Like that don't have that um, determination. I would say what what kind of like do you think gave that to you that you were like well i'm gonna set my mind to it and like it's until it's it's a it's like a no i'm gonna do everything i can to try to make it a yes i think there's two parts to it one is the immigrant mentality that my vietnamese dad instilled in me right that hard work discipline like you know hard work is everything obviously we know it's not <laughs> but at the time that's what i knew the second is uh, my Jewish dad instilling like being bold. That was a big, that was a big theme. Um, and that really stuck in my mind. So if you have hard work and discipline and you were bold enough to do it, <laughs> you're unstoppable. Like I was okay. like, I am not, not getting to this program, right? So dude, I was going to his office every single day. You can ask him, Dr. Uh, Dr. Armament, Peter Armament. Like I was at his office every single day, like, hey, I, I should be in this program. I shouldn't be in this program, you know? And I, 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 I had no people that were previous um, students in the program that were backing me up. And a good resume, uh, already real life work ex experience. I was just getting into the stock market and the capital markets. Um, so obviously there was some learning there, but I kind of, um, you know, and obviously doing the Jasmine, uh, Jasmine's course where we travel around the country presenting, that obviously worked in my favor as well. So I kind of stacked all this up and with a little bit of balls and, and uh, cojones, you, you know, you can't, 
you can't look at someone in the eye that does that and not respect them. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's really what 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 carried it. I, I will say in this day and age, it is uh, such a rare thing to see that if you just put that d- determination and grit, you will stand out, right? Like, I, I mean, I'm, I see it all the time. I work with a lot of kind of like students and anybody that kind of like comes to work on, even if it's just on time or like has the desire, you're willing to want to invest in them and kind of like grow them. So, you know, that's kind of like a tip that I think is huge kind of like out of your story is you have to put in the work to achieve whatever goal that you're going for. Yeah. So I'd one up that I'd say you'd have, you have to be willing to do what others are not willing to do. Like, love that. and and the thing is, is not that much more. (laughs) You think about it, right? I mean, Mm. what did it take? I mean, it took me five minutes going to his, his office every single day. Right. Like, I'm sure you spend more time on, you know, on the internet or whatever, checking your phone, dude. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like, so it's all mindset and it's all determination. Like if you're determined to do it, you'll do it. But yeah, you're right. I mean, I wish, I wish, uh, more people understood how easy it was to stand out. You know, Mm. I I think even to this day, people don't do that as, as much as you think. And, Agreed. and you can stand out so easily by doing that. I mean, in an authentic way and, and. That's really lacking right now. Yeah, I agree. So uh, you you get into the program. You're starting to do all these financial cool financial programs. Um, you you I mean you're eating it up, right? Like you're like I love this, and then you actually make the decision to hey like how do you land that first job on Wall Street? Oh, it's, it's very simple. Everyone was talking about taking the CFA as a chartered financial analyst. Um, you know. I was a terrible test taker. So I was like, <laughs> there's absolutely no fucking way this is my route, you know? Um, and I knew I was not, I didn't have good grades. I mean, at some point I had a 2.0 and they were like about to kick me out of Cal State Long Beach mm. and cut off my financial aid and all this stuff. Um, and so I made the conscious decision to learn other skills that I knew would carry me uh, further which was networking, like that was the biggest thing, right? So sophomore year, end of sophomore year, I started interning. Um, I remember my first internship was at UBS in Century City. So think about this, man. I'm 19, no, I'm 20. Yeah, I'm probably 19 or 20, and I'm interning in Century City for UBS for all these like brokers, you know, running, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And... I would work during the day and then I'd drive two hours back to Long Beach and go to my night classes. Sometimes I would be late, um, but to me, that was more valuable than the classes themselves. You know what I mean? Mm. So, I, so I, I had a lot of work experience by the time I graduated. That plus the programs that I did, uh, I knew would get me into a, um, the job that I wanted. Mm-hmm. And you, 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 so you made it happen, right? Do you remember that moment when you kind of like, was it, has all of this been kind of expected? Like you're, you're just getting the results that you, of what you put in or does anything come as a surprise to you? Everything is a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't very confident in myself. I mean, I had the balls to do stuff, but you know, I was like, man, I hope this works out. You know, that's kind of my attitude. Um, mm. I didn't have confidence in my process. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I had confidence in my process. I didn't have confidence in the outcome. And I was very outcome oriented at the time. And, mm. um, you know, that really affects your emotions, right? Um, so, yeah, I remember I was, I mean, at that time, I mean, dude, I was essentially working more than I was going to school. Um, I was probably copying most of my homework. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, because it saved me a lot of time um, and learning most of my stuff uh, from other people and from people in the industry. Um, so I did a ton of internships. By the time I graduated, it was like almost like I was like almost like a seasoned analyst, you know, like a, maybe like a third year analyst. Um, nah, I wouldn't push it that far. Maybe like a second year analyst, you know. But the internships that I did is a whole different story, man. Like, and, I, and this is I push for this too is. When you do internships, you should be very aggressive on internships. So I'll give you an example. The UBS internship, I literally walked in. Um, I applied for the internship. 
they, they took me in and I walked in and I said, uh, I want to talk to the manager. And so so they, the manager was this name. Her name was Cynthia. She ran the entire program um, for UBS, all the wealth management and the brokerage. And I, I talked to Cynthia and I was like, hey, I'm not your normal intern. Like I have mm-hmm. all these skill sets. I've been running businesses for, for, you know, a long time now. And she's looking at me like, dude, but you're so young. Like, you know, what possible experience can you have? I go, this is what I can do. And I, I had a paper and I listed it all out. And I go, this is what I want in return. Right? I said, mm-hmm. literally, it, it would list all my skills. I was, I was like, I can do, I'm an expert at power, making PowerPoint presentations, you know, um, any spreadsheet stuff, uh, coding, all that stuff. And then I said, what I wanted was, <laughs> I'm not stuffing envelopes. I'm not doing all this other shit that you're probably going to make uh, interns do. But what I want is, I want to be in the meetings that I'm not supposed to be in. I want to be. I, love that. I want to be part of the the management stuff where you make all the key decisions, and I want to learn from that, right? And so, it's very ballsy to, for an intern to come and say 100%, that. hundred percent, a hundred percent. But if you don't ask, you you thousand percent, you won't get it. So, um, I asked for it, and I got it. And mm. um, this was an unpaid internship, so I'm like, the fuck can I lose? You know what I'm saying? Where they could not pay me? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So. <laughs> <laughs> so the mindset is totally different for me at that age versus like other students, right? And so it was funny because it was an intern class of about maybe 20 kids and I was the only one doing that work and everybody mm. everybody hated me. They're like, "Why do you, why aren't you aren't why aren't you doing what we're doing?" I go, "Bro, go talk to Cynthia." <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know. I, I didn't tell them what I did. I'm just like, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I was just put on this project. You know what I'm saying? You guys, they were literally st- stuffing envelopes. Yeah. Doing marketing materials, cutting out like flyers. like, And I was like doing PowerPoint presentations for her and, and all the stuff, man. You know, what What I really love about kind of like th- this journey so far is that there, I think there's a ton of self-awareness, right? Like you, you, you understood that there were going to be some challenges for you. You're not going to take kind of like a tr- more traditional ri- route with like excellent grades and with kind of like all those different things. But what you did effectively was you found a different path and made it so that you had certain advantages, right? And so now you've kind of like gone up to the top. You've kind of like presented yourself in a very effective manner super ballsy like that's not something that i would have ever done and then you kind of laid it out on the line and it, it worked and so like and then and then everybody else is like dude what in the world did this guy do right like how is he able to crush so the amount of times i, mean, I could tell you in my life that people have looked at me like that i mean it's too many to count and i think it's mm. it should be more common right it should be normalized and the fact that it's not shows that I mean, you, just as human beings, you're inherently lazy. You know what I mean? Do, do I want to wake up and eat Cheetos and play video games? Of course I do, man. Like, why wouldn't I, right? But would I get a six pack and would I, you know, be in shape and all that stuff? No. So um, the one thing I will say that's interesting about that is it's really, I will say like to students nowadays when I, when I speak at colleges is when you're a student, you have so much room for error like you don't have a you don't have like a foundation really you don't have a reputation you don't have a network right so i would be as aggressive as possible you know what i mean Mm. like there's no downside what are they gonna say like fuck off you're a student like who cares you know what i mean they're not gonna like blacklist you from you know getting a job it's just like you're a student i mean that's the whole point right so if i was a student in my mind the self-awareness luckily i had that um, I was like, I'm going to be as aggressive as possible, man. Like, because the downside is nothing. Upside is everything in that, in that scenario, right? So there's this concept that I've always subscribed to, even at a young age, is I want to stack everything in my favor, mm. right? For example, like, why would I even run a restaurant? <laughs> it's already stacked against me. The, re- <laughs> the restaurant failure rate is like 90%, right? 80% after three years. So... So the, the whole concept of like stacking things in your favor is a really mm-hmm. important concept to me. And I, I feel like a lot of people should be thinking about that at all times, right? And this, this other concept of like, hey, if you have weaknesses, work on that. I really think that's bullshit. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like I, at least I was self-aware enough to know my weaknesses and then to focus on my strengths and lean in on mm -hmm. it, right? So the reason you have weaknesses is once you're aware of them, you can delegate it, right? <laughs> or you can figure, figure someone else to take that position, right? And, and I've learned that through business is I have tons of weaknesses, but at least I'm self-aware and I can delegate it, you know, and find partners or, um, or employees and managers that can fill that gap. Um, but this whole point about, you know, um, working on your weaknesses and all that stuff, I really don't believe in, you know, cause I mm. think it's, it, it's, it's a, I don't think it's a good ROI on your time. What, what do you feel is like the best ROI with your time? The best ROI with your time, I think is to, to one, find mentors. I mean, I can't stress that enough is finding mentors is so key to succeeding in life and business. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't even know how many, I can't even count on my hands how many mentors I've had. And, mm -hmm. and I wanna explain mentorship a little bit because many people have this concept of mentorship as like, hello, can you be my mentor? Yes, I will be your mentor. Now we're mentor, mentors, right? <laughs> like, it doesn't work <laughs> like that, bro. Like, you know, it very rarely does it work like that. What generally happens is you befriend somebody and then you show some curiosity and some interest and you build a reputation, right? Like if, you know, my, my professor, Ammerman, became one of my mentors at some point because I was going to his office every single day, right? Mm. And there was no conversation of, being, of like, can you be my mentor? It was just like, I was just there all the time and asking him questions and all this stuff. So the, what I tell people is like, you basically trick people into mentoring you. You know what I mean? Okay. So one way is I, you know, one of the ways I do it is like, you know, I meet somebody, I see a skill set they have that I'm lacking that I really want to work on um, or that I want to improve on, right? Um, and I go like, hey, you know, you don't mind if I like call you up sometime and if I have a question or something? And they generally say, yeah, of course. You mind if I call you anytime? Is that cool? And they're like, yeah. And I'll literally take them up on that offer. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, I call a lot of people. I do the old school way of uh, just calling them and asking them questions and learning stuff and taking down notes. Um, it's, it's a constant decision to do that. And I think um, in a way they're mentoring you, but they just, they don't, it's not like really official. You know what I mean? I don't think you really need official mentors. Hey, every Tuesday, let's meet and talk about what you need to work on, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, no, yeah. I, I think I think even having even being in rooms full of smart people, you're being mentored by them. Mm -hmm. So you know, you kind of like guided us through you know some of the story now, uh, and you, you you have a point where you get, you're get out on Wall Street. You're are you you enjoy it? Like, it, was it was it fun for you? At first, it was. Yeah, I'd say the first couple of years, first five years was amazing. Like I was like, whoa, this is how it's like. It's just like in the movies, you know. <laughs> so um, it's like a band of brotherhood um, doing crazy stuff. I mean, I'll give you an example. My first job out of college um, was at a hedge fund, and mm -hmm. we did uh, swaps. So if you know, you don't know what that is. That's like um, they're derivatives right? It's like you're swapping one asset for another or swapping one thing for another. So you can do interest rate swaps from fixed, fixed rate to variable rate. I don't want to get to the details, but you're doing swaps, right? And the firm I worked for was probably the, the most notorious swap firm in the world. Um, we had, I had guys from Bear Stearns at the time and JP Morgan all calling me up for help because we, we ran about $60 billion in notional swaps so we did a lot of trades wow um and the way i got the job was i walked in with the resume and applied like that's the way that's the, that's another one for the books um but i was also offered a job from capital group and which paid way more i mean I, i'll tell I'll tell you be very transparent i was paid like thirty two thousand dollars thirty two thousand five hundred my first job at the hedge fund, which is uh -huh. at that time, peanuts. Now probably even worse, right? Um, <laughs> ca Capital Group uh, was gonna pay me like 75K. 
And the reason mm -hmm. I didn't take Capital Group was I walked into Capital Group and they made me take this like test. And I remember I finished taking it and they were like, oh, you did pretty well on the test. And then they looked at my, sat me down, looked at my grades from Cal State Long Beach and they're like, I think I ended up with like a 2.9 or a 3.0, I forget. But it wasn't amazing. And they were like, you got a 3.0? That's pretty impressive. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, no, it's not. And that's when I was like, I'm not working for Capital Group. <laughs> you didn't trust them? Dude, if someone looks at your grades and you're on a 4.0 scale, right? And someone says yeah. they're impressed by your 3.0, that means their standards are pretty low. <laughs> yeah. So in your mind, you were like, hey, like, I, I feel like, you know, what did that say about the company to you? See, I was very self-aware, man. Like, I, I think that's one of my things that I've learned at a young age um, was I extrapolated a lot from that. Number one, I realized I wasn't going to learn a lot from them, right? Mm -hmm. Number two, I knew their bar was very low, which means I'm going to be surrounded by low caliber people. And number mm. three, I was like, there's a high chance I'll be just shuffling paper. I'm not going to be learning much. You know what I mean? So, yeah, will I get paid more? Um, a lot of my friends took the high paying jobs. I mean, they worked at Wilshire and all these other companies that pay. But, man, hearing their stories were crazy. Like, they'd play football in the middle of, <laughs> in the, middle of the trading room and stuff like that. Like, you know, um, they didn't learn shit. It was like run by monkeys, right? Um, just like you see in the movies. I, I I mean, I used to go hang out with them all the time, grab lunch, go over there. They'd be like playing football with like um, toilet paper. You know, you'd, you'd throw across the room and I'm like, what are you guys doing here? Right? <laughs> like, you know, like a frat, right? So I knew that by taking this lower paying job, I would learn how to make money. I would learn very specialized stuff that you can't find anywhere else. Like, do, do you even know what swap asset management is? Right? Like, mm. I didn't know what it was at the time. But I was like, this sounds gangster as fuck. So I'm going to take this. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, yeah, that was that was the start to my career in Wall Street. And they threw me to the wolves. And I survived it. And they respected me for that. Um, and uh, that's kind of been my mentality. I mean, what a great start to Wall Street, right? <laughs> you know? I think that's huge. Um, I think oftentimes, too often, we are we chase the the bag as opposed to the skill set. So people that go after like, okay, well, I want that high paying job versus like, hey, what can I actually learn? And, you know, I think it's paid off. So, you know, one, one question is like, you know, where are those people that took that kind of like cushy job where um, they were just kind of like earning versus like where you are now? Like what what's the difference there? <laughs> I know where they all are. <laughs> I know where they all are. They're fucking miserable. Yeah, they're fucking miserable and I wish I can save them man, and get them to the light but it's just not possible at this point and many of them are my close friends right and can't do it look you can make these decisions they're just going to have consequences we all know that and I knew at a very early age that I wanted to take the the lesser known route but like learn a shitload you know what I mean? Yeah. And at the time, it was like, am I making the wrong choice, dude? Everyone's making bank. You know what I mean? Mm. But I remember at one point, like, you know, when I was like going over like Wilshire and a couple of the firms and they were playing football with toilet paper and shit like that. I'm like, no, nah, I made the right choice. <laughs> I made the right choice. These guys aren't learning shit. Like, you know, and, uh, you know, at my firm, here's how my firm went. We did swaps, right? We, we also did a ton of like these structured deals um, we did, I, I was in charge of buying, um, tobacco bonds and, uh, and, um, stuff like that. And how it worked was I walked in and I said, Hey, you know, I'm the new guy. Okay, cool. They said, go talk to Matt head trader. Um, he's gonna, he's gonna show you the ropes. I went over, talked to Matt. He goes, I ain't got time for you, dude. Go look at the computer, look at the drive and figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> that was a training program. So literally for the first two weeks, I was looking at stuff in the folders you know um yeah that, there, was, there was literally no training program and the funniest part was a client walked in one day this was probably like my third weekend a client walked in one day and was like ah you guys have a great operation here like you know 
you know, you must have really good analysts and a good team. How is your analyst program? And my boss was like literally up in front of me t- talking to the client. He's like, ah, we don't got a program. We just throw them to the wolves. <laughs> I'm like sitting here, I'm like. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what happened to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So whoever survives it, survives it. And they, you earn their respect that way, right? And uh, trust me, many people were hired. No one came through, bro, except me. I was yeah. literally the last standing analyst that, that made it, you know, past like year two. Um, but um, shit, did that give me some firepower and some knowledge and some Teflon, you know, Teflon skin. That's awesome. That's amazing. So uh, how long did you work on Wall Street before you decided to move to something else? Uh, too long. Uh, I, I kind of went back and forth. So I worked there for about two years. Um, but we're talking about like 70, 80 hour weeks. I mean, I was sleeping at the office many times. Um, the commute each way was two hours from Long Beach to LA. So I basically ate, slept, you know, everything there, dude. Um, I left there uh, for ethical reasons. I mean, they, you know, long story short, you can look it up as public information. But after I left, uh, everybody except three people went to prison. So um, <laughs> that's my wow. <laughs> that was my first job on Wall Street. Um, <laughs> so uh, I went back to my father and I was like, "Okay, I'm leaving this job. Um, I don't know what else to do." And he goes, "You should come work for me." And I was like, "Okay," you know. And that's when I worked for him. I worked for him for about three years. This is on top of my early years of working for him. Three legit years. Um, well, that's a whole separate education in itself. Because I was like, hmm, I do want to learn from a Jewish father. I think he'd be a good mentor. And he did. But those are probably three of the most difficult years I've ever worked in my life. I can't, I can't, wow. even, I can't even explain it, dude. It's just he ran the largest packaging company on the West Coast. Um, it was open 24-7. So, like, you know. I implemented an entire ERP system for about 500 employees. Uh, he made me work in every single department for three, four months at a time. Um, so by the third year, I, I essentially knew how to run the business. You know, um, so there was no shortcuts in that in that game. Once I finished with him, I was like, I want to go back to Wall Street. So that's when I left and I moved to Boston, New York, to to work on Wall Street. So probably at the time, I was like 27. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's when my like dream was fulfilled. Um, I wouldn't say the first job was because it was like it was it was it was very uh, sparkly. But I mean, you know, everybody except three three of us went to prison, so you know, outcome was kind of funky, right? Um, yeah. But yeah, once I moved to Boston, was the start of like my quote unquote Wall Street career. Yeah, and then how long were you out there for? Twelve years. 12 years, 12 years. I only worked, worked at bulge bracket firms. I never worked for a small firm. And it was just, what's crazy is I've never really gotten a job just by applying that blindly or through a resume. It's always been through a network or a referral. The job I got on Wall Street at the time was with Bank of America. And it was a quant job, a quantitative analyst, mm-hmm. but like but like kind of higher, higher up. It was like, you know, third year quantitative analyst and I had no experience at quant and my one of my buddies that uh, worked with me at that um, firm the one, one of the ones that didn't go to jail uh, <laughs> was there and he's like you got to come over here and work for this for for b of a it's a, it's a good opportunity and I was like bro I got no the, the, the requirements like MBA, like on your way to a doctorate, like quantitative experience can do, you know, and I was like, dude, I have none of these requirements. He's like, no, just, uh-huh. just apply, like you'll get in, dude. And so I went, applied uh, through him and uh, I got the job. Yeah, that's how I, I started my Wall Street career on the East Coast. That's awesome. Um, and then when did you realize that Wall Street wasn't for you? And that you wanted to chase the entrepreneurial dream. It kind of happened over time. Um, and I stayed longer than I really wanted because I, I got married and then I had responsibilities and stuff like that. Um, but honestly, it was probably like third, four, fourth year in was, you know, I'd have, I'd, I'd have all these ideas. You know, growing up in my environment, it's like 
dude, I can make this more efficient. I can do this. And no one gave a shit about that stuff. You know, mm -hmm. they cared more about like, hey, what are the Patriots doing? You know, uh, what are we going to have for lunch today? You know, that sort of stuff. You know, the corporate bees, you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like, like robots. And that really didn't jive with me. There's a couple pockets of guys here and there that I still talk to today that were entrepreneurial. Like they start their own side hustle or whatever. But like, yeah, I didn't really jive with anybody in that sense. Um, I've, I only learned the game, the corporate game, like my sixth year in. And that's when I started getting promoted and all this stuff. <laughs> but like the first five years were pretty rough. Um, Cause you gotta play the politics. You gotta be likable. Yeah. You gotta be all the stuff. You can't just get on a merit. You know what I'm saying? Um, and that's where people kind of fuck up is they think merit is gonna take you all the way. Working hard, uh, doing really good work. I mean, if you're in the right environment and you have a boss that really looks out for that, but everyone has career risks that you don't know about. You know what I'm saying? So, um, so yeah, that that was when um, I started getting that feeling. So. Four, fourth year in, I started running side hustles. Like I, I, my first company I started was a bookmark company. I'm almost ashamed. Bookmarks. Of yeah, I was selling bookmarks. You said I like it. You heard it. I was selling bookmarks when everything was going digital. <laughs> <laughs> it failed miserably. I think I sold like four bookmarks, and three of them were my friends at the bottom. So, um, mm. uh, and then I went through iterations of of, of starting up businesses on the side. Um, at one point. And I can probably say this now because it's probably a statute of limitation, but I started a research firm <laughs> outside of like... Wow. So I had an office across the street from my building and I would run over there, take meetings during my breaks and during lunch. And so I was <laughs> I was on Wall Street with my own sell-side research firm. Um, Just hustling. Yeah, a full-time analyst. Um, I didn't net much, but we probably made like 90 grand off that side hustle in revenue. Mm. Most of it paid to my analyst, um, but uh, no, it was fun. It was fun. It it it, it piqued my curiosity on uh, on on being more entrepreneurial. And in Boston is a very big entrepreneurial town, you know, with with uh, Harvard and um, you know MIT and stuff like that. So I'd go to Cambridge and hang out with the the startup guys, and I really felt like a fish out of water because I'm like I'm on Wall Street, and they're like we don't give a fuck, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> and so. And so it was really hard for me to kind of break into that, um, being on Wall Street. But over time, I've, I got used to it. And as co-working spaces evolved, um, I really believe co-working spaces were really ahead of the curve in Boston versus New York and some other states. Um, you know, they had places like CIC near MIT and all the stuff that were very uh, strong co-working uh, um, spaces with like pretty big, you know, um, funded companies. And I would hang around there most of the week. I would work on Wall Street. I'd run over there and go to events over there, you know, and, and build my network there. But I never really knew how to make that jump um, mm. until I got, until I was forced into it, which was I got married and my uh, now ex-wife, she started the first cold brew tea company in the United States. And so by default, like I got pulled into that business. <laughs> so... Um, so, so I'll, I'll give you a pain picture for you. That's kind of funky, right? At one point, this is probably my sixth, seventh year in Wall Street. Now, I have a Wall Street job. I'm running a side hustle, a research firm across the street. I'm working nights and weekends on the startup tea business that my ex-wife founded, and I'm running Airbnb out of our the the house that I bought. All in a week. That's wild. Like, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think back and I'm like, how the fuck was that even enough hours? To, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So, were, were you? Do you remember if you were just running from place to place, or oh like, god, were you just like, oh god, yes, I didn't, dude. A lot of it, it's it's funny because a lot of it I attribute now to PTSD. Like I have, I, I believe I have PTSD from that. Um, that during that period of time. Yeah, yeah, man. It was like because you didn't have time to breathe. I didn't have time to breathe. It was like always something like i never slept and you know, right now i have sleep apnea i have i had these health conditions and I'm, I'm telling you a lot of that is from overworking myself during that time you know what what uh made you say yes to those things versus no to those things i felt like i said yes because i felt that was my way out of wall street 
Like if I can mm. be involved in these projects and learn it fast enough that I can build enough income or learn enough skill sets that I can leave Wall Street. So that was very motivated, right? I was like, okay, this T-Biz is gonna, we're gonna exit. And, and dude, we did well. I mean, we raised money from, you know, Sam Adams. I raised money from a venture capital firm. I think I raised two and a half million for the tea business. Um, unfortunately, I got divorced and lost everything. But uh, regardless, the I think the thesis and the idea and the execution I had was was on point. Mm-hmm. Um, and and like you to answer your question, I felt that that was my way out of Wall Street. Yeah. And so during this period of time, when you start kind of like executing, start raising money, like was that. Um, a skill set that you had acquired just with your time on Wall Street to be able to raise money? Whew, that was a long process. Uh, if you told me in my early career that I would be a salesperson, I would be doing sales and raising capital, I would, told, I would, I would bet you my entire life savings that I wouldn't be. Mm. Like, there's no way, right? Um, I thought I was going to be that, that uh, make a name for myself as that analyst in the back that found like, you know, really good stocks and made people a lot of money, which I did at, at, at a point in my career. But then I started realizing, again, that, that, that kind of like self-awareness that that wasn't really my strong suit. I was, I was starting to get more social. I was starting because I was networking so much in Cambridge, right, with all the startup guys. And I was like, there's so much more to, 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 to everything in life and to business than just being an analyst. So I started doing social experiments on myself um, to become more social and to become more, uh, because I'm an introvert, right? And I really broke that limiting belief that introverts stay in the back office and, you know, do back end stuff. And so I'm doing social experiments and things like, I remember, I mean, I'll just tell you a couple because I think it's interesting. I think everyone should try it. Um, one is I would bring flowers to the subway in the morning and in Boston, Boston's very well known for people being like, like, you know, they avoid you in public, right? Yeah. Cause they, it's yeah. like, it's cold and people are made sometimes miserable and stuff like that. I get it. So I would go into the subway in the morning with flowers and I'd go to people and I'd say, I'll trade you this flower for a smile, you know? And I did that for weeks and that really pushed me on my comfort zone and, you know, kind of, it started my journey on like this uh, uh, passion for r- random acts of kindness, which I'm still very passionate about today. Um, another experiment I did myself was because I wasn't very popular at work at the time. <laughs> you know, people were like, this is just like a nerdy guy or a guy that just works by himself. And man, he just works too hard for no reason. He's trying to like climb the I'll corporate ladder. But I wasn't like, yeah, but I wasn't liked by, by, by a lot of people. You know, I didn't work well with people you know um and people that that were i quote unquote not as smart as me were threatened by it so so you know i didn't really understand that dynamic um so i would i would have this experiment where i we were on i think the 65th floor (laughs) every every lunch period every time i went to lunch starting at my floor anyone that got into the elevator i would try to convince them to go to lunch with me Mm. So I'd be like, oh, so where's everybody going to lunch? Oh, there? Oh, I'm going over to, uh, to, to uh, you know, um, you know, to Rockets. Uh, you guys should come with me. They got amazing burgers, you know, this and that. And I would, I would basically train myself to do like that, thir- you know, 60 second pitch, 30 second pitch. As an introvert, how, how challenging was that? Do you remember, like, did it make you like phys- physically kind of like, nervous did you feel anything like while you were doing it oh it sucked it sucked it would make me cry bro like i mean i would like on the be on the verge of throwing up and many times i couldn't even do it to mm. be honest with you like many times i would just be like uh, and then just like <laughs> go down the elevator in silence right but the times that i did it you know it kind of pushed me one step ahead to where i needed to be it was like i said it was a very long process um, the other thing I did, I, the last one I'd say is, you know, I would go home every day on my walk from work to my house. I would ask, you know, I made uh, a note to, to force myself to ask 30 people, 30 or 50 people for the time. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it'd be very blatant that I have a watch on me, right? <laughs> it didn't yeah, matter. Yeah, yeah. It's like, excuse me, do you have the time? 
you know, because I had approach anxiety, you know, I couldn't approach people without getting really anxious and peeing in my pants, you know, um, figuratively and maybe sometimes literally, <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but like I would force myself to do that before I got home and I wouldn't go home until I finished, you know, all 30 or 50 or whatever. That's wild. So, so what, you know, I, I think that there's, a, again, some self-reflection in here of like, hey, this is a skill that I want to try to do. Was was there somebody that was giving you advice to try these things or was that just a challenge that you gave yourself? There was a couple people. Um, there, Some of the people that, that I started noticing that the people that I was, I was learning from were very good with women. Um, one mm. of it was my coworker you know, good looking white dude. Um, we'd go to a club together and like girls just like swarm him. You know, I'm like, what the fuck? Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> but what I started learning very quickly was, you know, the people that are good at stuff naturally are very bad teachers at it. Because mm -hmm. they don't really understand, like they don't think about it, right? It's just inherently natural, natural. natural to them, right? And, and that's why I hate the advice of when people say, you know, just be yourself. It's like, bitch, I'm being myself. It's not working. That's the that's why I ask you for advice. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, but that's what I found out. And um, instead of asking them for advice, I just observed them, and I just studied them. You know what I mean? And then I started doing social experiments on myself and kind of learning it from trial and trial and error. So um, again, I again I can't state this enough. It was a very long, painful process, um, and. One thing I'll say about that is very interesting because I just talked about like, hey, you know, I didn't, you know, when I said like, you know, don't worry about your weaknesses so you can delegate. I don't mean fuck your weaknesses. Like, don't ever think about it ever again. I'm just saying like, don't double down on your weaknesses, right? But what I learned was many times your weaknesses or what things that you, you are, um, that you hate doing, right? You hate doing it because you suck at it, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Like, the, my example is like, dude, if I can dunk, I would love playing basketball every day. In fact, I would probably play every day. I'd be dunking mm -hmm. on people every day, right? So w once I started becoming better at sales, I started enjoying it more. Like, you don't yeah. enjoy things you suck at, right? But to get better at it, you have to enjoy the process of sucking until you get better. You know what I mean? That I think that is such a valuable, valuable point. Uh, I I recall a time. So you know, I was really big into the EDM scene. Love like electronic music. It's my jam. And I remember getting like a DJ set and kind of like you know playing with the turntables and that sort of thing. And I brought it to like I was like so excited about it. Right, I brought it to my friends and I started like playing music on it. And when I was playing music on it, it was like literally like it was like tires screeching. <laughs> like, it was so bad, so bad. And like you know while I was kind of like you know playing around with it, it was like even though like it was so terrible, I in my in the back of my mind I was like, hey look like you know this is just part of it. Like, are, are you able to accept the fact that you aren't good at something? Because the moment that you accept that is the moment that you say, okay, well, this is where I'm at today. Let me get a little bit better tomorrow. And I remember about like six months to like a year after uh, we went to like a cabin and I, I brought up the same setup, right? And I was just rocking it. And it felt so good to me that I had gone through that to make it to that step where it was something that I enjoyed and other people started enjoying enjoying it as well gotcha yeah no for sure for sure so you understand that process that is I, I love the fact that like you continuously time and time again is like just challenging yourself like hey like I'm, I'm just gonna go out there and, and do this because like I, I want to improve so I have to ask was you know you you had this kind of like uh, friend with you that was kind of like you know um getting all the babes right like he was just like you know out there and was that kind of like your inspiration to kind of like i gotta get better at kind of like the social aspect uh to be able to kind of like do that or what was the inspiration behind that dude the the whole you know being good with women it plagued me throughout my early years i mean i'm like a hopeless romantic so i've always been like what people call now a simp, right? <laughs> but back then it was just like, it, you, you would just call it being a pussy. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, I think um, 
even when I was like living in California, working on, on at the hedge fund, all the way up until when we talked about me being on Wall Street, that had plagued me for yeah for a good amount of time. So that was something that was always in the back of my mind that I need to really work on, and hence the reason for you know befriending uh, my friend. Uh, he was one of the top sales guys at Bank of America, and. Um, yeah, I started following him everywhere as much as I can and just learning as much as I can from him. And, uh, you know, with the, with the hopefully the outcome being better with women, right? But the mm-hmm. side effect of that was getting better at being social. And it actually helped my career more than it helped with me being good with women, <laughs> right? So, That's funny. So, and, and what's funny is by being better with your career, uh, it helped you with women. So... It's like, yeah, it's a whole backwards Cic- way that cyclical of type deal. Yeah. 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 Um, do you remember, uh, so during all these experiments while you're kind of like going through it, while you're being super nervous, do you remember a point in time where you felt like the tide has shifted or like, oh, wow. Like, Hey, that's a moment where I'm feeling better about that side of life. With women, you mean, or? No, 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 no. This is more of like, you know, your social, during your social experiments, like you're kind of like putting yourself through the ringer, training yourself, right? Like you're in the gym, put, like doing the push ups. Like, was there a moment in time where you're like, oh, it finally clicked? Like, like, and, and really, like, is there any advice for maybe somebody that's introverted out there? Like, hey, like, this is the moment that it clicks for you. Yeah. Um, the moment that clicked for me was, when my goal was to get more women, right? <laughs> okay. I remember at the okay. time, because I was going out like, to be honest, I was going out like six nights a week. And okay. I was like, I'm going to get this down one way or another, right? <laughs> and I remember, because I would go out with my co- coworkers and friends and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And we were probably, we had a routine. Six nights a week we'd go out and, um, you know, it was all always routine. Like Tuesdays was this lounge, Wednesday was this club, you know. And dude, I hated it. I mean, but I loved it at the same time. Like I hate I hate going to clubs. I hate that environment. Because mm. for me, it's like, you know, that requires more body language than nonverbal communication, which I was terrible mm. at. Um, and I was better at, you know, just talking in general. Um, but I remember a point where, like, I swear to God, it was like four in the morning. We're at a club, and then I looked at my buddy, and I was like, "Don't you got work tomorrow?" He's like, "No, I got work in like three hours." <laughs> and we were like, "We were like, damn, we've been at this for a while, huh?" And we're like, yeah. "Yeah." And I remember that's when we were like, "Okay, we need to slow this down, right?" And so I went back to work, and through a period of like several quarters, I started to get like like promotions. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like promotion after promotion, and it was just like, wait a minute. This is not coincidence, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was just that I was learning the skill sets at the time. Yeah, was I trying to get better with women? Sure. But I just got more confident in myself and my ability to talk and um, and build rapport and all those things that you kind of learn um, that your dad or whatever is supposed to teach you <laughs> that I never was mm. ever taught. So I learned this from, from just trial and error. And I got so good, I became very likable in the office. You know, I, I, I learned how to play the politics. And I, there was a moment when it clicked in my head and I was like, okay, that's how the game is played. Got you. Um, in, in terms of other aspects, right? So, you know, during this period of time, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that you were also kind of doing, um, you know, the startup, uh, the tea startup. Uh, you also had kind of like multiple different things that were happening at the time. What uh did this kind of social aspect also play beneficial into that arena as well yeah because it's so funny because working for my father in manufacturing and stuff like that i was like i'm gonna get away from that right and then my ex-wife started the tea business i was like wow i'm back in manufacturing (laughs) i was like (laughs) wow it's following me life is so fucking it's so much irony in life dude um Mm. and all those skill sets just came back you know what i mean it's like wow now it's so applicable i'm building out infrastructure i'm building out 
a manufacturing plant. I'm building out retail locations. I'm doing sales to distributors and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, it was like super key. It was like, it was that, it's like that Daniel, uh, uh, Daniel Sun moment where he's like, ah, mm. you know, I got to do this move to win, right? I was like, dude, That's right. this, is, this is the moment. This is the moment where I put all my skill sets to use and everything I've learned is going to be applied to the limit. You know what I mean? That's awesome. And w- at what point do you leave the kind of like security of the, that, you know, uh, corporate job? to kind of like, cause there's, there's this gap, right? There's this, I also, I often call, call it like the leap of faith is when you are kind of like there, you have to make the call of like, and, and it's, I, I believe, um, sometimes easier, especially if you have a side hustle where the side hustle just starts taking up so much time that you don't have any other choice. Right. So right. what, what, what was it for you to make that decision to go full in on, in entrepreneurship? Yeah, I mean, the hope is that the side hustle just generates so much income that you're like forced to leave your your full-time job. But I feel like many times that's not the case. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, in this t- in this this time, it was not the case. Uh, there was two moments actually for me. Um, one moment was when my mom had two strokes, and mm. uh, this was actually not even that long ago. But um, she had two strokes, and I literally got up, left my job, and came over here to take care of her and wow and I remember my boss like pleading to me like you can just take a break and I was like my mind is not into it dude like it's not even it's not even a question in my mind like I'm done right so mm-hmm. I, I left and then was here in California taking care of my mom in the hospital for like four months uh, or something like that something ex- an extended period of time and then I finally went back to to, to the East Coast and then many, many of my colleagues had moved on to other firms and they're like, come join us at this other company. <laughs> and, so I, and so I went to the other company, right? Because it was such an easy transition. And in hindsight, yeah, would that have been a better time to kind of exit the Wall Street you know, space? Yeah, probably. But I did that for probably another two, three years. And then I was just like, I had a terrible boss. You know, they, they were working us to death. Um, I was fixing all my boss's work and you know he hated my guts and it was just just a really bad environment and and then I it, it just coincidentally the tea business uh, we had to make a choice on it because it was failing so many times and I was building it out right because um, my ex-wife was not a business person I mean she's a creative mm-hmm. so I said look this has failed like four or five times now the only way is if I come in and get involved full time. And so we both made a constant decision for me to come in and be the CEO. So that's when I quit my Wall Street job. Uh, we were still doing Airbnb. Um, my research firm, um, I was still trying to do, but it was struggling. So I ended up getting shut down. And um, I was still getting residuals and stuff, but it wasn't enough. And I made that leap of faith. Um, I didn't go straight into the T right away. I left Wall Street and I joined a fintech company that paid me like one fourth of what I was getting paid at Wall Street. But it was backed by two famous uh, hedge fund billionaires, right? And I was like, this is a good startup. Uh, It's, you know, I get access to all these like, you know, high level people and that's how I got started. Did that for, and that was just pure sales, sales Mm -hmm. and capital raising. Did that? I only lasted like two years in that. They they let me go because I was doing too well. <laughs> I was like the top salesperson, but you know, it's neither here or there. But it kind of did me a favor because that's when I went full time into the tea business, and that's when I came in and was like, t- told my ex wife, I got to come in. Uh, you know, you've got to hand over the operations, or, or else this won't work, and this and that. So I came in, you know, ran the entire operations and try to get her to just be the creative creative founder. Mm. I, uh, one thing that I, you know, this is something that you said earlier that stood out to me. Um, what made you come back to California to take care of your mom that just had the stroke? So it's it my biological mom. Um, one, I was shocked. I was in shock. Uh, two, 
I didn't realize because my relationship with my biological parents are different than my siblings because obviously I was uh, blacked out from the household for a good four Quite years. Quite some time. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So um, in my mind, I was like, you know, I'd never move back there. I made a promise to myself. Um, silly promise, but um, we have a different relationship. Like the relationship with my dad is is getting better now, but it's it was very transactional, right? We talk about business, we talk about that sort of stuff, but never what happened. <laughs> like that that'll never come up, you know what I mean? Um, it's just not talked about, and I wish it was in uh, like the tra- traditional Asian family. But what surprised me was how much it affected me, and mm-hmm. and how much. I mean, I, I showed so much so much emotion, like when it happened, and when I came here. And I didn't understand why my siblings didn't show that emotion. And I think it was partly because of the way they were raised to not show emotion and, you know, express their emotions. Whereas my Jewish family was very liberal. And they were like, if, if you need anything, let us know. And, you know, they're very supportive in that, in that sense. That was what, what was really shocking to me. Was everyone seemed like cool and calm when maybe inside they were panicking. And I was, yeah. pan- I was panicking on the outside. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like my mom could die, you know. I was like, I was a wreck. <laughs> There's mm-hmm. no other way to put it. I was, a, I was a wreck. Um, I could barely hold myself together, and I didn't expect that. That was, that was probably the most shocking part. And that, that's really what pulled you kind of like out of kind of the, the work that you were doing, and to spend some time with the family. Yeah. Um, uh, and you said that you were there for kind of like four to five months, and then you, and then you decided to kind of like go back out to, you know, the, the industry. Um. I think that's such a, you know, especially in Asian culture, it's such a, you know, we, I think the American translation is like filial piety. Um, I don't know. uh, Is there like that same concept in Vietnamese culture where it's like, we we call it Xiao Sun in in Chinese. Um, But it's like this concept of kind of taking care of like the elders and and elders respect. Do you guys have something similar to that? We do have it. I think it's kind of lost over the second and third generation. I don't mm. know how it'll play out for us, for my family. Um, but, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think a first, second generation was, that was like a pr- priority or a requirement, right? And I, I feel like over time, it's kind of gone away from that. Um, so I respect yeah. anyone that kind of follows that still. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's enough of that. Um, that I see, uh, especially when it comes with like third, fourth generation. But um, yeah. but to answer your question, that wasn't really the reason why uh, I came back. Uh, why I came back was my, I didn't realize like how much I cared about them until that happened. You know what I mean? Like that really shocked me because I was like, I thought I was like emotionally removed from them because I'd you know been adopted by a Jewish family and group with you know a whole group of different people and stuff like that but when that happened it really it really shocked me Mm. well i'm I'm sure that um she's thankful for the time that you kind of like decided to come back and and spend time with her um i think that that's huge so you know let's kind of fast forward so you you've now are kind of you know running the tea business you're the ceo of the tea business um what are and, and i think you know, one of the things that's interesting is everything that you had done up until this point is building you up for this moment to kind of like take control of a company like at this level, right? Like in terms of kind of like the contacts that you have and all these different things. Can you elaborate on that a little bit and kind of like go into, I guess, some detail of like how important it is for for you to have gone through all these experiences as like, and to finally sit, sit in the CEO seat. Yeah. I think that the number one important thing was leadership and I had never taken any leadership classes. I'd never read any leadership books, just became pushed into like a natural leadership role, right? As CEO. And my style was kind of framed after my Jewish dad style, right? Working with him for so long and, being mentored by him and I remember one time I was like you know how can you be so blunt and all this stuff and where when did you build that persona and he's like you know it just kind of happened over time 
And what I realized from the conversation with my Jewish father was I'm not him. You know what I mean? I do have like a bluntness to me now and uh, like a sense of urgency that he, he's taught, taught and instilled in me. But I, back to your question, how do introverts, you know, become, uh, you know, it, like better themselves and get out of the comfort zone is really you have to find your own style. That's really the hard mm -hmm. part, right? And I always thought that style would be like you'd have to become an extrovert. It's not the case. You can be an introvert, mm -hmm. be in sales, but you just kind of build a process and build build a style that really fits around, you know, what your personality, um, you know, that works in your favor. So when I became the CEO of the tea business, I was a, le I was a leader and a CEO that led by, um, by example. So you see me, I'd be the guy that, you know, shipment comes in of, of 2,000 bottles. I'd be, you know, pushing the pallet around and moving things around, right? So when people see that, they were like, wow, like, you know, he's, he's really doing it. You know what I mean? So I would work much harder than any of my employees, as I should be. But, you know, you'd be surprised how many owners don't do that. So that really uh, was my leadership style. I was very calm and collect. I was very strategic and I was very fair. And that, mm. that, a lot of that stuff was instilled in me by many of the mentors and my Jewish father. So the fairness part, especially, um, you know, if someone had like a issue with something or wanted a raise, I like, I'd be, I'd sit down with them and be very fair about it. Um, I couldn't say the same for my ex-wife. I mean, she was like the antithesis of a leader, you know, being a creative, mm. creative, like people hated working with her. Um, and what was interesting is, and this is really profound, even though it's so simple, is that little things that you do have sometimes really big impacts on people's lives, right? So I'll just give you an example. Uh, so you, I was a CEO of this tea business for probably three and a half years or whatever. Um, but I'd been involved in it for years before that, you know, part time. And the way I, I, mean, I had employees, I hired and fired them and this and that. And when I joined um, Asian Hustle Network, AHN, um, you, you remember I posted the intro, uh, like this intro post of my background. And the first message I get is from a former employee that worked at my tea business. And he was like, hey, I just want to let you know, I never got a chance to tell you this, but you were an amazing boss. Like probably one of the best bosses I've ever had. And like gave me all, all these like kind remarks. And I was like, damn, I don't really remember that. Like, I, rem I remember who he was. I just don't remember what I did to create that impact. You understand what I'm saying? So Huge. like, so it was just like this, it really opened up my eyes. And on the flip side, there are people that impacted me in my life. Like my Jewish dad probably doesn't even know how much impact he has had on my life. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, and certain other people but like man these little things that you do random acts of kindness or just helping people out or the way you lead as a ceo changes people's lives and you just you know it, it happens and, and no one generally tells you in the moment but uh you kind of learn about it later hopefully you know i think that's so valuable right like as business owners we have such a, I mean, not only are we responsible for kind of like leading our teams, but even with our actions in, in a day-to-day -day environment, our responsibility is to, to our people and to try to help them grow. And the fact that like, you know, you don't remember what you did, but obviously this person did. I, I think that that's like, that's where, where really the money's at, right? Because if you can consistently do that every single day, regardless of, you know, what role that you're playing at any sort of organization, I think ultimately that makes the world just a better place overall. I agree with you. Yeah, absolutely. And so you mentioned this random acts of kindness, and I know that this is a huge point that you kind of like keep kind of like, you know, bringing up, like, what do you think random acts of kindness does for the world? Oh God, Jesus. Uh, I think it's, it's random acts of kindness, I think is like a chain reaction and you don't know how far that chain reaction goes. It's, it's to me, one of the coolest things I've ever, you know, been passionate about. Um, I'll give you one, I'll give you one story that's wild. Okay. Um, 
So about two years ago, I was in Mexico. Uh, there was a, a girl that posted that she was having a baby. We were, it was in Playa del Carmen. She was having a baby and she needed to go get the baby checked uh, through a doctor in Merida, which is, for people that don't know, like three, four hours away. And she posted on a Facebook group and, um, you know, I need, I need to get to Merida for my baby, this and that. And people just responded with suggestions. <laughs> Think about that. They were like, you should try the Collectivo, which is like the, the public bus. Oh, you should try this, you try that. And I literally was like, I was so upset. I messaged her and I said, what's your Venmo? She's like, what do you mean? I go, how much does a, a cab ride cost from Playa de, to Merida? And she's like, it's really expensive. I said, that's not what I asked. I said, mm -hmm. how much does it cost and what's your Venmo? And she was like, I think it was like three, 400 bucks or something. I don't know what it is. Um, and I ven ven Venmoed her the money, right? Because I, I look at all these people giving suggestions, but it's like the solution is just giving her the money. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so she got, apparently she got there on time, whatever, right? And I like random acts of kindness because there has to be no strings attached, right? It has to be altruistic. So um, I generally, I, I've, I've even sponsored after school programs in Mexico and they would be like, that's amazing, you know, because it'd be like thousands of dollars to run these programs. And they're like, that's amazing. We'd love to have you speak in front of the kids. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You guys take the credit. Like, I don't want to. Uh, that it's all it's all you guys like I'm just the back-end guy right um, I don't want anything in return so so take take that in mind fast forward to now two years later um, I did an intro on a random Facebook group and um, I get like 2,000 messages like literally Facebook messages mm. and I can barely go through them and, um, you know, people want to connect with me. They're like, your story resonates with me, et cetera. And this girl messaged me and she's like, hey, you know, I just want you to let you know me and Haley are doing really well now. And we really thank you for that. And I was like, who, who the hell is this? <laughs> and it's the girl I Venmoed to two years ago. That's crazy. Right? No, it gets crazier. And so I'm in LA doing some acquisitions and I go, so where are you at now? Are you, are you still in Playa? She goes, no, I'm in LA. I go, I'm in LA. <laughs> and, so, mm. and so she's like, oh, I'd love to host you. And, and, you know, my mom loves you to death and all this stuff. And so like literally last week I went to go meet them. And Haley is an amazing baby. She had like a, a natural uh, water birth and all this stuff. And it was so funny. I walked up and the mom is like so happy to see me as if like I'm family. And Haley is grabbing onto me. She's like, she's like, no. she's like, she, she wants to, she, she's like, you know, when you, you walk up, generally babies don't really want to do that to me. Like, <laughs> they're like, <laughs> I don't have that reaction from babies, but Haley was just like, she was like grabbing onto me. Like, you know, hey, grab me. So I was holding Haley. And so we had a long chat, uh, we went out to dinner, had a long chat, caught up and yeah, man, it was like, you know, crazy thing like that happened, you know, off of little things like that. So it just proves again, like, and she's gonna, she's been helping others, right? So, mm. I don't know, man. It's that Tupac saying, right? Like, <laughs> I hate to quote quote, quote Tupac because, you know, you know, I think, uh, I think he had a lot of profound things to say. But, you know, he's like, I may not be the guy that is gonna change the world, but I'm gonna spark the person that will. You know what mm. I mean? So, like, to me, I kind of look at it the same way with um, random ac acts of kindness is like, you'll touch someone's life but you don't know what they're going to do. You know what I mean? And you don't know what the people they touch are going to do. So like when you talk about like how big do you think random acts of kindness can go? I'd say almost infinite. Like you can't even measure that. Mm. I think that's huge. You know, I, I, I believe that it's with people like you, um, it, it's our responsibility to really like put that, uh, emphasis on this important topic because you know the world's kind of a crazy place uh at times and the more that we can kind of like just be able to touch people's lives in a positive manner i mean that's a memory that you will have for the rest of your days right like it's like hey like you know just helping out and then all of a sudden like you have the opportunity to meet with their family you are family like 
and it's also something that's so simple of like everybody's like trying to figure out like okay well you know giving suggestions like you said like oh like you should you should try this person or whatever yeah but no one's actually doing solving the problem yep. and i think that if we spent more time solving the problem i think that we would get much further along i i i agree with you i believe that and we need solutions not advice you know what i'm saying so yeah um i mean even that in that instance like why wouldn't we just put $10 each a person, 30 people, it would have been solved. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it was a matter of urgency, so I just took care of it. And look, I even, I even do this stuff even when I don't even have the money. You know what I mean? Some, mm-hmm. I've, I mean, for not trying to be bold for whatever, I've, I've paid for people's heart surgeries. You know what I'm saying? And that mm-hmm. shit's not fucking cheap, bro. And I, I when I was running the gymnastics business, um, you know, we were doing some cash flow and... I was, you know, paying for the sort of stuff to the point where people thought I was crazy. Mm. They were, they, and some of the, some people around me were like, hey, do you want me to like hold your money for you? Like they thought I was like going out of my mind, uh-huh. you know, and that really bothered me. Like, you know, because they, they, whatever I say, they won't understand. You know what I mean? Why I'm doing this, you know, why I think it's important, that sort of stuff. There's certain people that just won't understand like random acts of kindness because they don't have that gracefulness and they don't have that empathy. They don't have those attributes. You know what I mean? So like they won't understand it. But for me, it's like, it means everything to me. Yeah. Get it. Well, let's, let's leave uh, at least the first uh, episode of us kind of like, you know, talking on the, you know, Adam same podcast on that note. Um, Love kind of like hearing kind of like this front end of the story. We actually haven't even got into the nitty gritty of like uh, entrepreneur stuff this yet, <laughs> which is crazy, right? Like we, yeah. we're just jamming right now. But uh, I wanted to thank you so much for coming onto the show. It's been an absolute pleasure and i um, looking forward to speaking to you more and giving so much value to kind of like the listeners um, of the You Know Adam Same podcast. No, awesome. I really appreciate you and what you're doing and kind of spreading, you know, this sort of stories around. Um, and giving you a platform to, to talk about it. So I, 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 I really enjoyed being here and I appreciate you. Cool, man. Awesome.